Micanopy hasn't changed much since 1928. The cars are newer, the buildings are older, but Micanopy seems destined to remain a town of history. And that is a good thing. I mention 1928 because that is the year that Marjorie Canan Rawlings and her husband Charles arrived in the area and settled into a rundown orange grove just east of there at a place called Cross Creek. Cross Creek was not a town and, not surprisingly, still isn't, but rather a collection of families who were mostly poor, surviving on fishing, working the groves, or whatever else was necessary to survive. But to Marjorie, it was a place of inspiration unlike any she had ever known. It is necessary to leave the impersonal highway, to step inside the rusty gate and close it behind. One is now inside the orange grove, out of the one world and in the mysterious heart of another. And after long years of spiritual homelessness, of nostalgia, here is that mystic loveliness of childhood again. Here is home. Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings. Living in rural Florida was not as appealing to Charles, however, and the couple divorced in 1933. Marjorie would spend the next several years at Cross Creek, tending the orange grove and writing voraciously. She would often spend up to 12 hours a day at her typewriter on the front porch. She wrote mostly of Cross Creek, the land, the animals, and the people, especially the people. Her first novel, South Moon Under, captured the delicate fabric woven into life of the creek. Cross Creek, published in 1942, is an autobiographical account of her years at the creek. I do not understand how anyone can live without some small place of enchantment to turn to. In the lakeside hammock, there is a constant stirring in the treetops, as though on the stillest days the breathing of the earth is audible. The Spanish moss sways a little always. The heavy forest thins into occasional great trees, live oaks and palms and pines. By necessity, renovations of her home were ongoing throughout her years there. A collapsing wall opened up the living room, and a closet was turned into a liquor cabinet, as it was the only one that would lock. There was no indoor plumbing for many years, although Marjorie eventually added two bathrooms. Dinner guests were often miffed that Marjorie never allowed anyone but herself to sit at the head of the table. Vanity had nothing to do with it. That seat afforded a perfect view of the outhouse, and Marjorie would never want to expose her guests to that view. Marjorie's vanity was cooking. She maintained a vegetable and herb garden throughout her years at the creek, and although she had only an old wood stove to cook with, it was not unusual for her to prepare five-course meals for her guests. I get as much satisfaction preparing a perfect dinner for a few good friends as from turning out a perfect paragraph in my writing. With money received from her publication of The Yearling, Marjorie purchased a beach cottage in Crescent Beach. In 1941, she married Ocala hotelier Norton Baskin, and they made their primary home in Crescent Beach. When Marjorie died in 1953, Norton collected most of her belongings and put them into storage. After the state of Florida acquired the property and designated it as a state park, he donated the collection to the park. It was as if he knew that the essence of Marjorie and Cross Creek needed to be preserved for the ages. After many years of neglect, the Department of Parks began administering the property in 1970, the same year it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Since then, it has been painstakingly restored. A new barn was constructed as close as possible to the original specifications. As the tenant house was beyond repair, a surviving structure of the same time period was moved in from an adjoining property. It has been restored right down to the sand yard that surrounds it. Over 90% of the items in the house are original to Marjorie, from the mixing bowl light shade she created to the beautiful china settings. Every year, thousands of visitors are greeted by volunteers from around the country who tend the grounds, feed the animals, and lead guided tours of the property. Before I leave Cross Creek and head back to that impersonal highway, I have one more stop to make. Down a dusty dirt road to a small cemetery where Marjorie and Norton 
rest side by side. Visitors often leave gifts here, sometimes a pencil or a pen, maybe a notepad, or sometimes a porcelain deer. I opted for the deer. Who owns Cross Creek? The Redbirds, I think, more than I, for they will have their nests, even in the face of delinquent mortgages. And after I am dead, who am childless, the human ownership of grove and field and hammock is hypothetical. But a long line of Redbirds and whippoorwills and blue jays and ground doves will descend from the present owners of nests in the orange trees and their claim will be less subject to dispute than any of their human heirs. Houses are individual and can be owned like nests and fought for. But what of the land? It seems to me that the earth may be borrowed but not bought. It may be used but not owned. It gives itself in response to love and tending, offers its seasonal flowering and fruiting, but we are tenants and not possessors, lovers and not master. Cross Creek belongs to the wind and the rain, to the sun and the seasons, to the cosmic secrecy of seed, and beyond all, to time. Mm -hmm.